What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ninja Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, this is going to be our WBDC show. A lot of news in the Warner Brothers world and also some DC stuff. Brian, you said that you, there was some mention of Superman that you wanted to discuss. Just uh, like little DC stuff. News. Yeah, okay. just little stuff on Superman like, as that keeps barreling forward toward uh, release date, but definitely seems to be moving. And we're getting little little tidbits on things. But going back into Green Lantern because that Green Lantern show did uh, that we got some pretty good uh, viewership on that that Green Lantern show. And Brian wants to go back and just sort of uh, talk about some things there. Um, just an update. Also, Brian Kevin Costner, Brian. I'm not going to probably go see this American story. I'll see it. Horizon? I'll see it. I'm a yeah. sucker for westerns. I'll let you know. Uh, it, I mean, it's a commitment. Three hours for part one, three hours for part two, and there's two more parts to go. You know what's dope about it, Brian? Although, you know, I, I'm not going to probably spend my time watching it, but maybe, I don't know, depending on your recommendation, Brian, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. The second part is just like six months away, which is an idea that I've had in terms of creating movies that you don't have to wait years for sequels for you know so that's that's very interesting but kevin costner man he said something so interesting brian kevin costner said i had somebody who said look please don't do this kevin let's do this i think they were referring to kevin wanting to uh release it in, in the theaters but they wanted him to his his people whoever he was working with wanted to release this into in, in a streaming platform but i'm glad about what i'm doing i believe in the big screen i believe in that experience you know i'm not one of those guys that has a director's cut the effing movie i make is the director's cut <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that again. You know, I'm not one of those guys that has a director's cut. The effing movie I make is the director's cut. Brian, you already know who he's talking about, Brian. What are your thoughts and how do you feel Zach took that? Because I'm sure somebody told him. This is Kevin Costa we're talking about. He has a big movie coming out. 10 minutes standing ovation for his movie, Brian, at the Cannes Film Festival. So he said this, Brian. What do you think of this quote? I mean, it's very on brand for Kevin Costner. <laughs> I mean, listen, listen, if you if you guys know, if people watching this know anything about his journey through Hollywood, he is nothing if not all in. Uh, this has been a story of his career. Like, what became Dances with Wolves was an Against the Odds Academy Award sweep that nobody believed in, that he went all in on as the star and the director, and you know that, and then it became this three-hour epic that won Best Picture. He's failed, right? He went all in on Waterworld, and that was a disaster. Um, but you know, Horizon is sort of the latest display of that. I mean, this is why he's not doing Yellowstone anymore, effectively. And this is a movie where he is out there obtaining the financing himself. There's a rumor that he has... Let me, let me just say this. When you talk about putting your money where your mouth is, there's a report that he has in the two parts we're getting. $40 million of his own money in the budget. Wow. Now, he's plenty rich, but $40 million ain't chump change. I don't care how wealthy you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if the total budget for the movie is called, movies are like $100 million a piece, he's putting 20% of that up himself yeah, before yeah. he goes to any other financier. So he's always all in. And as a result, yeah, he's making the movie he wants. And he's not baiting you with another version of it. Funnily enough, that quote that you sent me came in close proximity to this. 
the sexier, bloodier versions of his Netflix Rebel Moon Saga will drop on August 2nd with two newly titled chapters instead of two parts. Originally released as Part 1, A Child of Fire, and Part 2, The Scar Giver, the director's cuts will be called Chapter 1, Chalice of Blood, and Chapter 2, Curse of Forgiveness. So that's, I guess, Zach's answer. So wait a second. So these two chapters are director's cuts of the first two films, but they have different names? Correct. They're supposedly oh, like I, I, these are each supposedly like three to four hours as opposed to the two plus you got. These are three to four hours of a waste of time. That's what they are. That's what they are, man. I mean, just trying to tell you there's blood and sex in it and telling you that makes it a different movie. As if that's why Rebel Moon 1 and 2 were terrible. Yo, can I sit in the room with you guys and pitch some stories, man? Nice. Is it that easy? I ask, is it that easy for this guy to pitch you something and you gave him whatever amount to make this stuff? It is just amazing to me. I will know. No, no, not amazing. I'm going to use Beast's favorite word. It's fascinating. That's what it is. It's fascinating to me. So Horizon Part 1 is June 28th. Three hours. <laughs> Horizon Part 2 is August 16th. Six weeks later. Three more hours. Wow. It's six weeks later. That's, that's a crazy. lot. I, I, will say, yeah. I will see it, but that's a lot. And then August 2nd, you, you have to get, I guess, six to eight hours of Rebel Moon if you choose to stream it on Netflix. So Get that. <laughs> Get that. How interesting um, article, Brian, that you sent. Uh, it's gun shoots down Batman filming. Yes. I am under the impression, Brian, just thinking about this whole thing and what James Gunn's plans are for Batman. And I would think that. For his plans, he really, Brian, doesn't want to compete with anybody else's stuff. Although the Batman, for the purposes of the business, did very well in theaters and the potential of it doing much better uh, in his second out outing is certainly high. And Zaslav, I'm sure, or wants that to happen. But as you all know, James Gunn has a way of working that things take time. But while they do, Brian, I am going to go and put myself out there and say that he already has the role, Brian. Oh, I mean, he just has it, but, you know, they're not going to just, because that's just going to cause so many problems for who? For James Gunn's version of the Batman, because why? I don't think people are going to care too much about it anymore, Brian, because Alan Richardson is the Batman that everybody's been wanting to see for a lifetime live action. The, the truest, the, Brian, this is the Batman from the comic books, if you do this. I don't think Matt Reeves' uh, movie is going to get the excitement or attention as much as Alan Richman, Alan Richman's Batman will. Well, Especially, Brian, if the success of Superman is astounding. If it is, then the expectation for Batman is going to be even bigger. And that, Brian, is going to be bigger than the Batman. Matt Reeves' Batman. So the rumor was that they were set to shoot Batman 2 and 3 back-to-back, -back, uh, I believe starting in, in the spring, and James Gunn debunked that. There was a separate rumor saying that Batman 2 had been canceled, and then he debunked that, and kind of was like, to your point, they're just letting Matt Reeves be, 
And obviously, you know, they do have the Penguin coming in September. So he has been spending some time on that, right? In fairness, like he is not just doing one thing. The project is still alive for sure. But I do think you're right from the standpoint of we, I would be shocked if we saw Brave and the Bold and Batman Part 2 releasing in close proximity. They will have to spread those out on the calendar so that people don't get confused about like, well, didn't I just see Batman? Why, why am I seeing <laughs> Batman again? Right? It, it is different, right? These are different films, different properties. You want to keep that separation. So I would suspect those projects will not be in the same year. They'll make sure the schedule is that. You know, you've been riding for Alan Richards for a long time. I have absolutely no qualms with that. I am still a little fish-eyed about the Timothy Chalamet comment in the promotional tour for Dune, a WB movie. Tim Chalamet is a WB guy. Wonka, Dune, he's in the building. This is a guy who very publicly told everyone at one point, Leo DiCaprio said, no superhero movies, and that he was subscribing to that. And then on the Dune tour... He magically let slip. Well, if the story is good enough, yeah, I'll consider it. And like, it's just one of those things where you're like, they had announced Brave and the Bold, you know, a few months, it was like a few months before that Mm -hmm. with this Damian Wayne kind of twisted, semi-psychotic Robin as the lead. Mm -hmm. And Robin is always the part that Chalamet physically looks like he could play. And all of a sudden he's open to this thing that he was totally close to his whole career up until that. It's just one of those things where I'm like, is there a conversation that's already been had? And I think we are totally riding for them. You can get Chalamet and Richin as you're brave and the bold. Like you're already in business to do business. And you're right. I think they can coexist, but they can also compete. And that's, that's, that's a tricky balance. Um, and you know, Pattinson's in demand. Zoe Kravitz is in demand. Like these are busy people. Like if you and this is a big shoot. Like Jeffrey Wright is in demand. Like these are people who you need to line up schedule wise for a major project. So you can't just like sit around forever. So you know I realize they delayed this for a year, but it it, it doesn't feel like there's a ton of forward momentum on Batman Part Two right now. Unfortunately, like I really want to see it. Because I really think there is something here that can be great. But yeah, I the longer to. it spreads, the longer it spreads, it kind of becomes DC's answer to Shang-Chi, right? Where it's like, is there a limit to how long you can go before you've lost whatever moment, momentum yeah, you yeah, had yeah. from the introduction of, of your character or this iteration of the character? If that announcement were to come around, it's just, it's just too, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, and he he's he's a star. He's an A-list star now, coming off of Reacher, um, and we know Chalamet's. You know, he's he's for actors under thirty, he's probably top three of people you could have. Now, I do think with that project, as with all things we talked about, there is a lot of like holding pattern due to Superman because they they've set their budget. They've set their course. We get a lot of updates on Superman every day, like little things about like the logos and like little bit parts being casted. And, you know, everything still sounds great. I mean, I know the image didn't really wow anyone, but I don't put too much stock in that. The trailer will be kind of like more more informative when we get that. Yeah. But you're right. It has to be successful. If it's not really successful, if it's not successful, successful from a profitability standpoint, I think it will have a trickle down effect on budgets for everything else and i would just point out you know we had this discussion about supergirl and and the the upside and the downside and the downside was female-led projects in this genre typically don't work and we just had another spectacular failure right furiosa is 92 percent on rotten tomatoes from the critics audiences i believe gave it an a minus so that's not bad that movie's going to lose over $100 million. Why? Because it doesn't have Mad Max in it. People just didn't care. It's a good movie. I saw it. It's a good movie. Is it an epic all-time movie like Fury Road? No. But it's a really good movie that was really well-reviewed from a director who's made a lot of good stuff in an IP that has worked. Nobody showed up. That is the risk for Supergirl. And Furiosa was budgeted at $200 million which is why they're going to lose that much money. So 
that's what I mean by like it still all comes back to Superman. If Superman's a big hit, the budgets will go to a certain level. If Superman's a mediocre hit, I don't know what's going to happen. Everything will be tentative after that. Exactly. And if it happens, the budgets will be much lower. Green Lantern, Brian. You wanted to uh, discuss something regarding Green Lantern? Yeah, well, first off, look, our show is a very small sample size, but we haven't really talked much about the character or the show since the national announcement. I thought it was interesting that, like, people care. People people wanted to see what there was to say about it. Um, but I had a, I had a mea culpa because I had all my notes, and I totally forgot because I had in the I had in the Berlanti column the whole earthbound version of it. And I forgot that they basically said we're gonna make true detective with Hal Jordan and John Stewart or Stewart as the lead and Hal as yeah. the second. Mm-hmm. Um and it would primarily be like an earthbound investigations procedural. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the gun version, not the Berlanti version. I for some reason mm-hmm. had that as that Berlanti wanted to do the earthbound show. So I think we had a discussion at the time when it was announced, and I still feel this way, that I'm kind of a little disappointed that it is so terrestrial, but that's money. I mean, if you can't realize that's what it is, it's just space is very expensive. Space shows are very expensive, and they're they're trying to improve the odds of success with a big-name writer's room and having this be set on Earth. And the only hope I would have is that if that's where we start, that's not, that's not where we end up. Mm. And this is really like a, a launch pad to get to space and to get to some of the cosmic elements of the Lantern Corps that are pretty interesting. Gunn mm. did add one piece of color, which I thought was interesting, where he said, comics canon would suggest that Hal is significantly older than John, which I think is a clue to your future casting, that Stuart will be a younger actor and the Hal Jordan we see will be much older than, well, say, man. like the way Ryan Reynolds played it a long, a long time ago. Okay. Again, man, hopefully it's not these dudes is looking for their ring because they, mispl- they misplaced it or something like that. Hopefully I think Gunn said they were basically trying to link like this idea of almost like ancient threats and cosmic things that were buried or hidden on Earth. You know what it almost reminded me of? He didn't say it, but it almost reminded me of like Dark Side looking for the anti-life equation on Earth. Like that idea. Idea. That's me speculating, but that, I, that idea of something very cosmic that just happens to be on planet Earth, that that's what they're hunting. And like that leads to, you know, bad guys and adventures and stuff like that. But I just don't want to see, like my concern is like, then you're using the ring on a very small scale. That's my one concern. Like if you're like, you know, you're fighting in a cave with somebody <laughs> versus like, you know, you're you're having this sort of space battle. As I, the scale is different. It's actually a smaller scale, but you know, the big name writers keep me interested as far as like what they're going to do with that. Watchmen, Brian. Did you yes. see the animated trailer? We got so so this kind of like, you know, it's funny because all the buzz because James Gunn loves Creature Commandos. It's like he loves talking about Creature Commandos. But I actually feel like the biggest news in animation over the WB it didn't come from Creature Commandos. It came from two fronts. But this is the number one front. I didn't know. So I didn't know this was happening. And I went me back neither. and looked. You know, when they announced this? Man. In 2017, there hadn't been a single update on this project since they first announced it. Tw- That's like how many iterations of management ago that this thing survived? It's just people that didn't really care to really find out about it, Brian. 2017 and nothing? And it just pops up out of nowhere? And it's Watchmen? Done. A two-part movie in animated form said to be basically note for note for the Alan Moore comic. I can tell you what I was thinking when they were, when they did this. They want you to forget about Zack Snyder's. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, no question. When when they say, and actually, you know, you and I would probably be more defenders of Zack's Watchmen as one of his more interesting things oh, he's ever done. Mm-hmm. But when you say this is the authentic note for note adaptation, you're basically saying forget Zack. And this forget is the TV it. show too. You're basically yes, saying like yes, yes, that yes, stuff yes. is not canon. This yeah. is the story. And I mean, you are more qualified to talk about the visuals, but it looks it looks good. No, the the visuals look good. I mean, it, it, it. I like where animation is going, Brian. In in this modern era, I'm not too into the. 
I guess, how would I say, kiddie stuff? Like, in terms of theme, in terms of storylines and things of that nature. And Watchmen is certainly not a kid's type of show or a movie. I think they, I think they confirmed it's TVMA. There you so go. It's an adult animated film. So, I, I mean, again, there's always been animation that's been for adults and stuff like that. But the way they're going about making these a bit more sophisticated would be the word, Brian. Uh, and, and, and more of a story-driven, accompanied with good visual effects is what all, what, what, what more can we ask for? And again, Brian, that's the first thing I saw, I thought about, like, oh, snap, they're trying to make this, people forget about this dude's joint. That's how far people have gone. I can't, now I'm waiting for the 300 movie, animation movie. Which would be great. There, there definitely, to me, you know, and this gets into a broader discussion, there's an arms race going on in animation, like, very quietly in our neighborhood, I think. Because, like, look around you at, like, what is hitting and what is working across the different streamers and platforms, right? Like we talked about Blue Eye Samurai, Netflix upping its game in sort of the anime style, you know, adult cartoon, adult animation, right? We talk about X-Men 97, perhaps even exceeding the heights of the original following What If's improvement. Go ahead. I think that X-Men 97 sort of has propelled studios to get it going to sort of compete at that level and I, you know but i would also like don't forget about invincible over at over at amazon right like that's another yes. show that has pushed the limit of adult mature but exquisite looking kind of adaptation and then you know like we haven't seen these but like uh, wb also dropped they got a lord of the rings animated movie um coming this december that supposedly was looked amazing like andrew circus is through know, mr motion capture is directing that and supposedly oh, wow. it looks incredible um and so like that's also coming around christmas right and so you're seeing this push forward in the genre we care about um and Ironically, it used to be DC that was kind of the king of that hill. Oh, yeah. And so all of a sudden, this isn't DC, right? But it's like all of a sudden, the, the parent company, WB, is like, don't forget about us with this. It's cool. I mean, and oh, let's not forget Cape Crusader coming in a few weeks, right? So this is what I mean. Like animation, all, all, the, ten all episodes. the things going wrong. Animation is like our security blanket right now. There's good things happening in IP animation. We gotta find a way to get some of these people involved in these projects to ask them about, to ask them five questions, just five questions, man. That's it, not take too much of their time, right? With shenanigans or whatever. Five questions that we really think about before we get them on the show and we vet them, obviously, we let them, whatever it is, because, so, so, they're questions that we want. I want to see how right we are. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm going to, I, I, his name escapes me and I apologize in advance. I heard an interview with one of the directors of X-Men 97, and this goes right to your point about five questions. And he was on a podcast and they asked him about Morph's powers because we had this conversation. Okay, 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 okay. And this is why I was like, this is why the show was great because he had the answer. And he's like, we thoroughly discussed this before we did it. So he had a specific answer about, so A, we couldn't, he's like, we couldn't find evidence that Morph couldn't co-opt the power, not along with the appearance. He said, however, this was, the answer was great. Morph's mutation is such that he has to constantly regenerate at all times, including the form that he has normally. So he said when he takes on, like, the Hulk, he's having to expend so much energy to be the Hulk and have the Hulk's ability that it severely limits how long he can hold that, number one. And number two is... 
there are certain powers he can't replicate. The powers that he can, he, it was great. He was like, it flows from strength. It flows from tangible. Now he can't do it. Magic powers, like momentum power, he can't do those. And I was yeah. like, that's why the show is great. Because you guys thought that through. <laughs> Thoughtfulness. Before you put it on screen. It wasn't just, you know what would be cool? It would be him the Hulk. <laughs> So I, I apologize. I don't have his name at the top of my, but when I heard the answer, I was like, that is the difference between a whatever show and a show that leaves an imprint is the details like that. Details like that, Brian, you know, you know, what's the other side who, who makes those decisions that, the, that they don't think about it, that say, you know, it would be cool and then do it and not really think about it. Well, you know, a lot of people out there. No, no, there's one guy. Uh, there's one guy. Y'all know who I'm talking about. It's all he over his movie. All, he does it all the time. You know what would be cool? And just does it. Um, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of uh, all this. WB making moves in the animation world and uh, Lanterns, what the show could actually be and the hope that it is it doesn't turn out to be. I'm telling you, if these dudes lost their rings, I'm done. I'm out. In the first episode, if they lost it, Brian, I'm out. Then you then you know the budget's not there. I haven't lost there. this ever. <laughs> then you know the budget's <laughs> not there. Yeah. We we ain't Gollum, okay? We we yeah. But that I didn't I didn't know about that Lord of the Rings thing, so that I'm very interested in seeing what that looks like. I was never really into the, the movies, but I saw it and I saw why it got the praise that it got and i saw lord of the rings the third the third uh uh, uh movie in in the theaters actually and i was like wow this is this is epic uh but i'm glad to you know animation usually tends to change moods and 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 take us obviously to places we haven't seen or doesn't look familiar because it's in that format but still, the stories that, I, that they tell certainly bring some sort of entertainment, especially if there's some drama and, and all the little things that make live action worth watching, right? Uh, but let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of all this, man. Zach's... <sighs> I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Well, we'll see you next time on the Ninja Report. <laughs>